called. He, he was available. Uh, he went. She was hurt. But she was great. So I said to her, and then I went to the list, and I said, she said, so was it better? And she said, oh, better, better. Yes. And then I said, do you remember what he said? Because I said, when he gets me, he needs to talk a little bit. He should be getting good. And then what did you say? Yes, I remember. Yeah. So she did. And um, we cut the breast. We didn't bring a boyfriend because I figured that was sick. We cut the breast. No, she took a while soon. So we'd ask permission first. Of, of course. You know, and then so, okay, so, and so it was about a half hour. And he went, Boy, we went. Absolutely. Very good. I remember, I went. I remember our time. Yeah, it was so nice. It was nice. Good morning. Seven should be the first one. Seven. And the next yeah. One, in four, case you can't one. read it from the screen. What? In case you can't read it. It'll say it on the big screen too. Just the words, yeah.
going to stay here so you can see. You okay? Yep. Wrong? No, I'm just, you know, I'm doing church work. So it gives me a little bit of frustration, unfortunately. Okay. But well, we should probably start pulling up. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you today. Welcome to our time of worship together. As we prepare for worship, first, I want to start with uh, announcements this morning. The first being that Wednesday this week, March the 2nd, is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the season of Lent. Um, the fact that Wednesday is already March is... Uh, its own sort of shocking thing to me that, that we've already gotten through two months of this year is amazing. But we will gather here at 7 p.m. for a brief service together if you would like to be here. And we were discussing, Are we? will that be streamed as well? Do we know that yet? It will be. Okay, great. So you will get an, an email uh, if you would like to participate virtually. So uh, in that... In that vein, if uh, we are still collecting Lenten meditations, if you're willing to write one and send it to Karen in the office, we would appreciate that. The other thing I know from reading my church email this week is next Sunday after church, choir rehearsals will begin again, which is great news. And, um, and as they rehearse, they'll let us know when they're ready to be a part of worship again. But if you have questions about that, please see Zoe. Are there any other announcements that I am missing this morning? Great. So let us then begin our worship together by passing the peace, waving, smiling. Well, you can't, you can smile, but nobody's going to see you. Wave whatever signal you have to offer. Um, let's pass the peace together. And now let us join together in our responsive call to worship. We come together today in awe and wonder before the God we worship. We also come burdened down with the worries of the world and the struggles of our individual lives. But in the midst of the worries and the struggles is God our radiant source of love and hope. We worship together today in awe and wonder to worship the God who transforms our lives. And in that spirit, let us rise in body and or spirit and sing together, joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
Please be seated. And I'd like to invite the children down to the front to join me. Who do you have with you there? Oh, nice. And they've got on a mask too. That's awesome. That's great. All right. There you go. So does anybody know, I know it's Sunday, but do you know what day of the month it is? I think you're right. February the 27th. So part of the way we try to remember what day of the week that we have a calendar. After February, I was just saying March is coming next and then April and you know how it kind of goes. Well, the church has its own calendar. The point of the calendar is to help us tell time and to notice when things happen. Some things we know on specific dates on the calendar, like when your birthday is, right? And when it gets to that day of the calendar, then you get to celebrate. If we didn't have a calendar, I suppose we could just wake up the morning and go, hey, today's my birthday, and just, you know, decide when it was. But this way, we know it's a specific day. So a long time ago, the people, the folks in the church decided they wanted to have kind of a church calendar, too. And so we follow seasons of the church year. It isn't, whoops, it isn't quite the same as months but it follows through. And the church year starts with the season of Advent, which is the weeks before Christmas. We, Advent's a season of getting ready for Christmas. And then after Advent is Christmas time. And then Epiphany, is, which is a word that means discover. And that starts when we celebrate when the Magi come to Jesus. And we're finishing up the season of Epiphany today. And the next season, or the kind of the next month on the Christian calendar, is Lent. That's the season of getting ready for Easter, for the res to celebrate Jesus' resurrect death and resurrection. And so it lasts for forty days. Our months mostly are about thirty, but the season of Lent is forty days. And sometimes people think about Lent. I know it's, it's a season when you're supposed to give up something. But I, wanna, I want you to think about it as you think about these days. Think about it as a season to kind of concentrate and think about things. Maybe, maybe instead of thinking you have to give up something, think about what can you do extra? What, how can you show extra kindness to people around you? How can you... Find little ways to let the people you love know that you love them. Be, to be more uh, intentional, to mean it, and to take time to do those things. But we're going to, we'll talk some more about what Lent is, but I just wanted to take a minute and talk a little bit about how we tell time and that this week we start Lent. All right? Let's have a prayer together and then you all can go to Sunday school. All right? Dear God, we thank you for the way that you love us. We thank you that we can be here and worship together. Help us to be more like you in the way we treat one another. Amen. Thank you. And as they move to Sunday school, are there joys and concerns that you would share together today? Yeah. Thank you. Others? Patty Ward asked me to share this this morning 
Her mother, Ginger, suffered a stroke last night and is preparing for heaven. We pray that she would transition peacefully to be with uh, Ginger's, I mean, Patty's father, Don, who was Ginger's husband of 68 years. Or I'm sorry, yes, that she will transition peacefully. We pray for uh, Don, her husband of 68 years, and hold him in prayer as he prepares to adjust to life without his best friend. Patty, we pray with you and, and Jeff also. Are there other requests this morning? As we watch the news, we pray for the people of Ukraine today as well. We've already begun to pray. Let us continue together. Gracious and loving God, we, we thank you for the ways that you make your presence known in our lives. This morning we come with anxious hearts. We come because this has been a calamitous week in the world. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for others around the world who are victims of war and oppression. We lift up Patty and her family today. Pray for Don. As we remember them, we think also of others who are dealing with family difficulties and grief. We are grateful for the many ways that we see your presence and your beauty, all the little things that remind us that even in difficult and sorrowful times, nothing can separate us from your love. And in that gratitude, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We were discussing this morning uh, before church that things seem to be lightening as far as 
some of the restrictions around the pandemic as we watch for that, that perhaps we're not too far away from being able to pass the plates to one another instead of just talking about them. But we're not quite there yet. And so this morning we come again to affirm our offerings, whether of our times or talents or treasures, that what we give to God, we give in response to God's unfailing generosity to us. And with that in mind, let us stand in body and or spirit and sing our doxology together. Please be seated and join me in our unison prayer of dedication. Transforming God, we come to you this morning knowing that in our giving and in our living, we have been reluctant to let go of our affinity for the things of this world. And in our attachments, we have often missed the opportunity for the transformed lives you desire for us. May our offering this morning be an invitation to living a life transformed by your power, love, and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christian in my heart. 
someday we will be able to go without these masks, won't we? Today, the reading is from Luke 28 through 36. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothing became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to them. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish to Jerusalem. Now, Peter and his companies were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, while he was saying this, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent in those days, told no one of the things they had seen. Maybe it's just me. Or maybe it's that we are close to marking the second anniversary of the full descent of the pandemic on our country. And just as we begin to get some hint that things might ease up on the COVID front, we've been watching Vladimir Putin invade Ukraine and then listening as the governor of Texas told people in his state to start reporting parents of trans children as child abusers. And that's just part of the news this week. We haven't even touched on any personal issues. So maybe it's all those things are what lead me to see how exhausted Jesus and his disciples appear to be most every time we come to read about them in the Gospels. They're living in their own whirlwind of people who wanted to hear Jesus, people who wanted Jesus to heal them, people trying, a Jesus in the meantime was trying to teach his disciples, while those who disagreed with him politically and theological, theologically kept trying to trip him up, and the Romans keep working to kill him. In fact, that's the thing that, it's that last thing that sends them up the mountain. The disciples had returned from trips to other towns, and Jesus started talking about dying, about being killed. After that, Luke says, Jesus took Peter and James and John and they went up the mountain to pray. As I said, they were exhausted before the hike. Once they got to the top, Jesus started praying and the disciples fell asleep. Then something woke them up. Jesus' face was luminous and he looked like he was dressed in lightning. Moses and Elijah were with him, and the three of them were talking about Jesus' death, his departure, Luke says, which he, he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and the others were still groggy, but they made themselves wake up to see what was happening. Peter, true to form, spoke up even though he had no idea what he was talking about. This is great, he said. And in his confusion, he shifted into hospitality mode. Maybe we should pitch tents for each of you. And, and he's kind of mapping that out. Nobody else said a word. And then as he was speaking, a cloud enveloped the mountaintop and God was in the cloud and said, 
This is my chosen one. Listen to him. And then the cloud and the voice and the two prophets and the lightning all disappeared. Jesus, Peter, James, and John were alone again on the mountaintop. Luke says, when they came back down, they kept silent. Even Peter. Maybe they kept quiet because they didn't know how to describe what happened. Or maybe they didn't say anything because they didn't have a chance. Once... The verses that follow tell us that once they got back to the bottom of the hill, the crowds descended on them again. The other disciples were in a panic because they felt overwhelmed. Nobody seemed to care what had happened on the mountain. They wanted to talk about their stuff. Up the mountain or not, life went on as exhausting as ever. Over the years, I've heard sermons on this passage that focused on the power of mountaintop experiences. Those moments where God feels especially close and life has a transcendency to it. Those sermons made it sound like when Peter says what he did, that he didn't want to leave, that let's build shelters for everyone and stay here forever. Then the preachers went on to say that we had to learn, we, to, we had to live in the valley because that's where things grow. We can't survive in perpetual transcendence. And that's a lesson worth pondering. And I wonder this morning about a different angle, a different way to read the story. Because the details were given make it look like the time on the mountain wasn't exceedingly joyful or euphoric for the disciples. It was puzzling. It was mysterious. I mean, they woke from a dead sleep to find Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah about his death. And then the cloud and the voice that told them to listen. And then they came back down the hill. They weren't any less exhausted or any more confident than they had been before they started climbing. They didn't know what had happened to them. The best they could do, it seems, was to not talk about it. And yet, here we are 21 centuries later reading this story, which means at some point, they did figure out how to talk about it. They did tell others what they saw and what they heard that day. But it was after they had taken time to reflect and remember what had happened. They didn't talk about their immediate reactions. They kept quiet and let it sink in. And as I said, when they came back to town, they walked into the middle of life and soldiers and crowds and everything else. But the fact that we have gospel accounts means that sometime, probably after Jesus' death and resurrection, as they began to try and figure out how to live without him, how to live in the spirit. They thought back on their experiences with him. Maybe Peter, James, and John first talked among themselves about what they saw and heard that day, and then said to the others, remember that time when we went up on the mountain with Jesus and we came down kind of dazed and nonverbal? Well, let us tell you what happened. Then they were able to begin to see what it meant 
to them beyond the clouds and lightning and exhaustion. And even then, what they heard and saw wasn't explainable. This morning, as we've read the story again, we've not explained it. We've only brushed up against the lightning. I was reading a book this morning before church, and I came across a sentence that said, we are often in life tempted to try and reduce the awesomeness of life to manageable proportions. I sat there and read that sentence three or four times. Let me say it again. We tend to reduce the awesomeness of life to manageable proportions. Perhaps what was at the heart of the disciples' silence was they didn't want an explanation. They wanted to live, to hold the awesome mystery of that moment. And that's the invitation this morning. Four days before Lent begins, two years into the pandemic that feels like it will never end. It's going to be a while before we know what the living of these days means for us. But we can begin to learn from them if we will keep quiet and listen and make, maybe look a little farther back to stories we've forgotten to keep telling. One of the reasons that's hard is because we live in a culture addicted to the immediate. Most of the opinions voiced on television or written in newspapers are about what happened today, not even what happened last year or last month or last year or the year before that. And those who are talking and writing are happy to provide concise, repeatable explanations for everything. But I think the reality is that we rarely learn in the moment what that moment means to us. We don't understand it in the present tense. And simple explanations don't leave room for the awesomeness of our unexplainable universe. We need time to be silent, to reflect, to remember the stories, and to retell them so that different details can rise and fall and open our hearts to greater compassion and understanding. As we contemplate life beyond the worst of the pandemic, for instance, perhaps now is the time to remember, to put back together again what life was like before words like COVID and Omicron and social distancing became so familiar. I, I'm not talking about being nostalgic here and wishing for, wishing that the pandemic hadn't happened. I'm talking about thinking back. What about those days is worth remembering? What moments were clothed in lightning or clouds? What exhausted us? What fed us? Where was God for us in those days? What from that time has sustained us? What stories are worth telling again? As I've thought about you as a congregation and as you look forward to finding a new settled pastor, I wonder if part of the work to do is to think back 
to your days with Jan? What are the memories you hold that feed you? What are the sorrows you carry from those days that need to be released? What are the conversations that have been left idle that need to be picked up? In the days and months to come, some of what we knew may come back. As I said, we were talking this morning on getting to pass the plates again. Some things may not. Life is not going to simply go back to the way it was for us any more than it did for Peter and James and John after they saw Jesus blinged out in lightning and talking with Moses. The days to come may continue to be as exhausting as the ones we're living, even if we don't have to wear a mask all the time. And just like Jesus, we're all going to die. One of my favorite prophets is Mavis Staples, the gospel singer. In one of her songs, she sings, death is slow, but death is sure. And then the next line says, Allelu, Allelu. That's the gospel truth. Death is sure, and so is love. Alleluia. We can be both tired and tenacious, exhausted and encouraged. Death is not the last word. Love is. And that's the story we keep telling over and over, even though we can't explain it. Amen. And as we think of those stories, please rise in body and or spirit and let's sing together, My Life Flows On in Endless Song.
Please be seated. My friends, we live in a world that is not explainable. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, Earth is crammed full of heaven, every bush ablaze with the glory of God. Some folks take off their shoes and the rest just pick blackberries. May we go, may you go out into the world to meet God at every turn in the lightning, in the clouds, in the silence, in the faces of one another. We were born in love, we live in love, and to love we shall return. Amen. Thank you. 